Hi everyone, this is Age of Agility and I'm Nick LaFleur. If you work in an office, chances are you've heard of Slack, the messaging and collaboration hub with more than 12 million daily users in 150 countries. Whether your organization uses workplace messaging platforms for catching up with the team, communicating project details, sharing cat photos, or all three, there's no doubt that platforms like Slack have become a vital channel of communication as many offices are normalizing to an increasingly remote workforce. Our guest this week is Amanda Atkins, the Senior Director of Global Internal Communications at Slack. Amanda and Shannon talk about the role of internal comms at a growing company and how important it's become for organizations to keep an open dialogue with their employees, especially during times of uncertainty. We also talk about building digital communities at work and learn a bit what that network looks like at Slack. Take a listen and enjoy our conversation with Amanda Atkins, Senior Director of Global Internal Communications at Slack. Welcome to the Age of Agility. This is a show where we talk to people who are facing unique challenges with an agility mindset. We'll learn from industry leaders, business and IT professionals, and even check in on our colleagues from time to time. Stay tuned as we explore the Age of Agility. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Age of Agility podcast. My name is Shannon Curran. I am your host, and we are super excited today to be talking to Amanda Atkins. So Amanda is the senior director, I want to get this right, the senior director uh, and head of internal communications and culture at Slack. So we are super excited to have her with us today. Thanks, Amanda, for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Of course. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So could you tell our listeners or our viewers a little bit about you, your career, how you got to where you are and your role at Slack? Yeah, absolutely. It's been uh, an interesting journey to say the least. So I am originally from Ohio, thought for sure that I was going to be a journalist. I went to journalism school. When I was a senior in college, I needed an internship and could not find a single newspaper or magazine to hire me. The only internship that I managed to find was one doing internal communications for a manufacturing company in Toledo, Ohio, where I grew up. And it that turned into an entire career. Um, prior to that, I didn't even know that internal communications was a discipline, that it existed, what it was. Um, and I fell in love with it so quickly. It was an opportunity to do what I love most, which is writing, but in a way that makes such a difference for people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as they navigate their own careers. And from there, I have continued to do internal comms, change management, culture, executive communications type work, uh, just in a variety of different industries. So after I left manufacturing, I um, spent a long time in, in retail. I spent some time in financial services and eventually found my way to San Francisco um, and to Slack Technologies. So I have had the incredible um luck to be part of building something so special at Slack over the past four and a half years and um, was hired to build their internal communications function, which I started uh, back in 2016 and have been able to shepherd the company through a lot of significant milestones from, you know, going from a couple of hundred employees to now nearing 3000, um, going public, obviously going through this pandemic and now um, closing this particular chapter of our company's history with um, the recent announcement of the acquisition by Salesforce. So um, it has been a privilege to be part of, of building this organization and shaping uh, what is a really remarkable company, making a huge difference in um, the lives of working people around the world. So it's a product I have a lot of passion about, passion for, and I'm just really proud of the, the, the work. And it's been a, an amazing experience. Yeah, boring few years at Slack, right? Nothing's happening. Real boring. Like <laughs> we, we like to say we like to say that um, working at Slack is like dog years. Um, yeah, you know, so every year is more like seven. Um, but boy, is that addicting! I mean, even the days where you're like, I'm so tired, I've been working forever, or you know, this is so intense. It's a lot of fun. That's awesome. So, for any of our um, our audience members that don't really know what internal communications is, can you describe that for folks? Like, what is that discipline, and what does that team sort of do within an organization? Personally, I uh, I think of internal communications as as really the connective tissue that keeps an entire organization 
working together in the same direction, on the same page, really supporting one another and understanding um, how they fit into the big picture. So from my perspective, internal comms is about um, being able to uh, be the interpreter of what different business strategy um, information means for different people across the company, being able to help executives understand what their employees care about, what concerns them, um, how they are feeling about different things, um, being able to help leaders show up as their best selves and understand how to best relate to their employee base, um, helping them uh, manage their reputations internally, being able to be a, a bridge between the external and the internal, which we all know in the you know current world is very very, very blurred. Um, there is no def definite line between what is internal and what is external. And we have to make that, um, you know, create that that clear experience for employees. Um, so well, and in the most basic terms, it's about making sure people know the information that they need to be able to do their jobs every day. I feel like there's so much more there in terms of helping people feel like they are connected to something bigger than themselves. Why are why are we all here and doing this work on this product, whether we are making sweaters or insulation or software or whatever it is? Why are we doing that? And why do we care? And what is that emotional connection that you're creating for people um, to be able to do their best work every day? And, and I think internal communications is uniquely positioned to be able to to paint that picture for people. Um, we are scrappy. We are have our fingers in all of the different things happening across the company. We play a little bit of a project manager role. We play a little bit of a, a an editorial role. We play a little bit of an HR role. We play, um, you know, a little bit of a, an, a leadership coaching role. It's a very nuanced discipline, um, but it's one that um, really holds all of those pieces together and keeps people moving in the same direction. I think there probably was no bigger year for internal comms than this past one um, for lots of different reasons. So we often talk about operational agility as having three components. So you have process, you have technology, and you have people. So culture, right? And this part of it um, has really shown this year as the companies that are doing this right are the ones that are um, really making it out of this, um, either doing really well, or at least waiting the tide um, of what could be depending on if they're in an industry that is be, was hit really hard, if they were taking care of their people, you can see the difference in how the companies are doing. So I know that Slack definitely didn't have an industry that was hit hard this year. Uh, it was the opposite, uh, just like the Zooms and the Slacks of the world that definitely had a different sort of set of challenges. But can you talk a little bit about the focus on corporate culture this year um, and that component of agility? This year, people who didn't truly understand the value of communicate of internal communications had a wake up call. Um, the reality is that internal communication happens in your company, whether you have dedicated resources or a strategy or any focus on it or not information is flowing and decisions are being made and people are feeling different things and reputations are being built. All of that is happening. And it's just a matter of whether you are part of the conversation and whether you are part of you as the company or the leadership or whoever that is, um, you know, are, are part of architecting how that happens. When something like 2020 happens when you have um, a massive shift in how people are working together and when you have um, much bigger demands on people's um, personal energy and health and mind space, um, when you're physically separated from people, when um, just all the rules are, all the rules have changed. The difference between a company that has a very deliberate and strategic approach to um, connecting their people to, to each other and to the company, that when that stands out from those who don't. Um, and I think we saw that. Uh, so I think corporate culture um, was forced to really examine the effort that they put into the employee experience. And the old the old um, infrastructures didn't necessarily apply. You couldn't depend on people knowing what was going on because they uh you know, had a conversation in the elevator when they came up right. in the morning, or you just couldn't depend on a lot of those old structures. Um, 
And you also had the bit, an, another wild card thrown in there, which is, you know, everybody is sheltering in place, which means that um, working parents didn't have childcare and people who had other um, caretaking responsibilities um, didn't have the same resources that they did. Like your corporate infrastructure for how um, employees understand what's going on and how they connect to all of it and how they connect with each other is has changed and the infrastructure of the world has changed so we had to really account for all of those things together i think employees more than ever before looked to their employers for not just guidance about their jobs but guidance about the world how are you taking care of us company how are do you care what's going on how are you reacting what are you doing about it um i think that is a trend that we have seen increase over time in general, in terms of employees expecting their employers to be far more um, vocal and involved in the world around us and making a difference in their communities. But this year, I think, um, was the point of no return. There's no going back to a world where a, where an organization can stay silent on um, the events of the world, whether it is a global pandemic or it's racial injustice or it's um, you know threats to democracy or whatever that is. We can't completely separate those things. Our world is too um, complicated and too um, interconnected to avoid that. And that influences company culture because people bring their whole selves to work. Whether you are the CEO of the company or you are um, you know, an entry-level customer support person, we all have to work from home and we're all trying to figure out how to balance, you know, our laptops on um, precarious objects because we, um, you know, our, our kid is using the desk or um you know, the, your, your cat walks through the background or whatever it is. Um, and so like our humanity cannot be masked. Um, and so even in the most old school, traditional conservative industries, um, you can't pretend that we aren't human. And I think that's influencing a lot of how, um, of employee expectations and it's um, influencing how corporations are needing to um, account for the kind of culture that they're creating for people. Absolutely. And I think I, something that I wonder about is, do you think that this is just from your perspective, obviously someone that probably advocated for this previous to this year, <laughs> um, yeah. but are you thinking that this is making better work? Like I can say that as a, um, this is just personally, but my corporate like costume never existed. I'm like literally incapable. Um, and so it was always really hard for me. So I wonder if bringing people's whole selves to work is actually making them the best professional version of themselves as well, but also it makes it more complicated. I know as a manager and as a leader, it's really, it's more complicated. You're managing and leading a very complex human being instead of a list of list of tasks and skills, right? Yes, that's a great question. And I think um, I think there are a lot of variables that affect the answer. I think when you zoom out to the 50,000 foot view, I think, yes, absolutely. People can do their best work when they are able to be their whole selves and whether, and a, and a lot of people I think have found that not having a commute and um, being able to be more, you know, flexible in how they spend their day um, has opened up a whole new range of possibilities of how they can be creative and be effective in their roles. Um, for other people, it's been quite the opposite. They find that that lack of structure um, and the lack of, you know, being able to, um, you know, be with other people in person and do that kind of collaboration has actually been a hindrance. But I think um, I think the, the real underlying thing here is how are organizations uh, reacting to that reality? And are they nurturing it as, um, as an avenue to better work? Or are they still trying to fit things into a box um, that doesn't necessarily make sense in these circumstances? And what I mean by that is um, we've even experienced this at Slack in some cases where um, certain people managers have a hard time um, encouraging their employees to sort of work at the schedule that makes sense for them. They're like, no, like I need you, if I need you in, you know, this from nine to five every single day, then like you need to be here from nine to five every single day. And the person's like, well, I really need to be able to take my kid to the doctor or my partner has um, a really important business meeting. So I have to be on kid duty um, from this time to this time. Can't I just pick this up, you know, tonight after they go to bed or, um, 
I think we're finding that um, people who are very are trying to apply the old rules to a new situation are actually hindering their employees' ability to do their best work. Um, whereas those who have been more open to um, embracing the, I think the the uniqueness of this new situation are finding that um, giving people the freedom to work in ways that work best for them um, can unlock a lot of effectiveness, a lot of productivity, and a lot of creativity. And it also builds a level of trust and um, connection, I think, between, between colleagues, but also between like, you know, managers and employees of, I, you know, I trust you to do what you need to do and to deliver what needs to be delivered. And if you are doing it, you know, after your kid goes to bed, I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, we all have lives and different things that we're trying to balance. And I think the more, the more that we as leaders and organizations are willing to embrace that, um, the better the work is going to be because people are going, I mean, that, that level of trust builds loyalty it builds, um, you know, just a, a level of uh, commitment that you're not going to get if somebody feels like they can't be them their best selves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is that trust goes both ways, right? And you, yes. and I think there is a, de- a different kind of coaching when you have to just let it. You you have to trust that they're go- that your people are going to work in the way that you expect them to. And if they don't, then that's just another discussion, right? Like that you have 100%. to have in any way, right? Yes. Like, I think that yes. that's absolutely, it's really interesting as a people manager, as a leader of a team to navigate. Um, I think you kind of just walked me into this. I promise I didn't prepare this, but um, I think you just described agility to us. Uh, so I would yeah. love to hear sort of from your perspective, how do you define agility and how do you see it uh, at Slack or in your other uh, roles? It's so interesting because I mean, obviously agility is so key to being effective in pretty much any job, um, yep. but certainly as an internal communications professional, it's part of my DNA, I think, is being able to act with agility. Um, but it's interesting because my in my monthly team meeting this morning, we have, um, we have a huddle every week, but we do a longer team meeting once a month. And we had that meeting this morning and we were specifically reflecting on um, how agility and some of these other um, major themes have shown up for us over the past year in the in the work that 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 we have done in the you know bizarre world of 2020 and um, one of my employees said something that just really has stuck with me which is um, in our roles we have to run into the fire before we can prepare anybody else to be able to handle the blaze. It's like, so we know that a fire is coming, like we run right in, like, and we're like, okay, what's causing the fire? Where is it spreading? What's going on? What's it gonna, you know, what are we gonna need to extinguish it? And then we like turn around and go back to like the masses and we're like, okay, we've got it. Like we understand what's happening and like we can help you navigate this. Um, But for me, uh, agility is, is, comes from having a really strong change management um, mindset, um, from being able to recognize that um, change is one of the hardest things that we deal with as humans, and that you can't just expect everyone to magically um, be able to handle it the same way and on the same time frame and all of that. And so have someone like an internal communications team or, um, you know, an organizational effectiveness or organizational development or gosh knows, you know, God knows anything, yeah. um, any, um, you know, any penny who's in like a leadership position who can really be effective at saying, um, I see a fire coming or a fire is upon us and I didn't see it coming. How can I ensure that I am leading in the right way to be able to shepherd my people through this situation? Um, I think that's really, that's really key. Another piece of agility for me is just, is the context switching and is being able to recognize that um, what was important yesterday might not be the most important thing today and being able to just really quickly um say okay i'm putting that away and i'm moving on to this thing um and uh we call it swarming on our team when there is something um something that requires kind of all hands on deck to 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 tackle so um for example the the, uh, the acquisition of slack by salesforce we announced it on december 1st and um I was able to tell my team on December 1st. I've been there. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
I bet, I bet. And it's, it's like, you know, so I had to tell them in the morning and then we announced it in the early afternoon. So they had about four hours of time to really process this before I needed every single one of them to have a very specific role, drop everything else that they were doing that day and be able to help us execute that announcement in a way that was going to create the best experience for our employees. And uh, that requires a remarkable amount of agility, a remarkable amount of um, context switching capability, um, being able to just say, all right, like I, and it goes back to trust, I think, um, you know, having enough trust in one another, enough trust in your leadership, enough trust in um, the process to say like, all right, like we're good. We're going to, we can make this happen. Um, yes, we're, we're in the fire and it feels hot, um, but we are, you know, we're, we're in it together and we know what we're doing and we know why we're doing it. Um, so I think that that is, um, it's something, it's a, it's a muscle that you exercise over time with lots of different, you know, kinds of experiences. But I think agility is, um, it's, it's all about, it's, it's a lot about trust. It's a lot about um, open-mindedness and curiosity um, and uh, not holding on to anything too tightly. I like the saying, uh, strong beliefs loosely held um, because it's true. Like, you know, something that you're like, this is my top priority today and nothing can distract me from this might be completely tossed to the wayside tomorrow. And we've got to be able to, to deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is a hard thing to learn. I think it's one of yes. those, especially if you come from a creative background of like, this is the thing that I have, like, I'm using all my creative energy to create this thing. And then they're like, it's no longer relevant. It is definitely something it's funny. Cause I, in the comms part of my career, I have also had to sort of learn that skill to say, well, now it's something else. And you're like, great. Didn't care about that anyway. <laughs> so, nope. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think maybe we were prepared a lot for 2020, but without knowing it, probably. Um, so to segue a little bit to the future. So I think this is sort of a two-part question. So we can, you can answer either both or one. Um, coming from an organization like Slack, which is a huge, huge component of enabling folks to work remotely and continue to collaborate, um, I know we are a Slack shop. We it was made it very easy. I know uh, for us to transition to remote because a lot of well, it wasn't easy, but a lot of our yeah. our processes did already exist in like sort of a chat world, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, is there anything that Slack is seeing in the industry that they're sort of predicting in the future of trends that we'll continue to see? Um, and then maybe in your role too, are you seeing things that businesses are doing? Um, that you think are really going to become the future of the way that we work? Yes, uh, definitely. I think one shift in language that we have started to use at Slack is that the building at 500 Howard Street in San Francisco is no longer our headquarters. Slack, the product is our headquarters. Right. That is our office. That is where we work. That is where we collaborate. That is where we, um, we get everything done. And it makes complete sense. And I think the reality is that Slack was our headquarters all along um, because the in the shift to remote, we recognized very quickly that, wait, all of our community is here. All of our, um, all of our work gets done here. All of our collaboration gets done here. Um, and that, to your point, certainly the shift to all remote was not easy and had lots of bumps in the road, but I can't imagine um, having gone through it without having already well established our own, you know, our headquarters home being in, um, in Slack, the product, as opposed to being in a physical office building. Um, so I think that is going to become true for more and more organizations. There's, I think there has already been a recognition that, um, you know, we're never going back to the exact traditional model that we were used to. Um, even when offices reopen and some of that, um, some of the quote unquote normalcy resumes, um, fewer people will work in offices full time than they did before. There will be more people who work remotely and there will be more people who um, work remotely part time and in an office full time, um, part time. You know, there will be much more um, dispersed workforces. There will be um, more people working um, in different time zones. Companies that previously were less global are going to be a lot more global mm -hmm. because people have recognized that um, we can still have 
very effective um, working cultures and we can still have very effective companies um, without a lot of those traditional trappings. So I think um, corporate uh, real estate is going to be a dramatically different um, world than it um, has historically been. I think the way that we think about shaping culture, the way that we think about collaboration, the way that we think about communication, all of those things are going to continue to shift to become more digital first um, as opposed to digital second or digital, you know, if we have the time. Um, and I think being able to, um, I mean, certainly I am biased by working at Slack and being, um, you know, having a product um, that is specifically designed to, to make that possible. Um, but I, I also just cannot fathom doing it without that. Um, just because we, we have, there's so many, there's so many pieces of work culture that happen certainly in the way that you work together, the way that you get your work done, the way that you communicate, the way you collaborate, all of which happens in Slack as our source of truth. Even, even every, you know, every conversation, every meeting, every major event that happens um, live or on Zoom or on whatever, um, Slack is still the source of truth. It's all going to be captured there in one way or another. And so I think being able to have that truly asynchronous way of working is going to be critical. Um, but Slack has also uh, been key for us from a more of a social culture perspective. Yeah. Um, and it's always, it always has been, we have a dedicated workspace just for social channels, um, which, you know, be communities around anything, um, you know, we've got public channels on every topic imaginable from different TV shows or music or hobbies or whatever. Um, so we have a lot of private social channels that are about, you know, more that are for more sensitive um, topics or groups. Um, we have uh, you know, one of probably the, the channel that got me through especially the earliest days of the pandemic more than anything else um, was our motherboard channel, which is for all of the moms at Slack. It's a private channel. Um, and it was just like the ultimate safe space to be able to talk to other women who were going through the same situation and having the same kind of troubles. And, um, or we have a, um, you know, or even just like kind of like sharing the funny things like, you know, memes or whatever that had made them laugh on a day when otherwise, you know, felt like the world was falling apart around us. Um, you know, so being able to, I think, find your find your niche uh, socially within the organization is really powerful too. And having those communities exist previously um, helped all of our people still feel that level of connection once we were remote. And I think that is just another thing. It's like um, the future is going to need to embrace employees as humans and people want to um i think when people are well connected to one another um via the communities that they build around interests and similarities or you know whatever that is um those have real work benefits because um you know all of those relationships that are being built talking about game of thrones or um you know questions about having a new baby or whatever that is um that is going to, that's building a foundation that makes that conversation that you have to have about, oh, we're cutting over to a brand new, um, you know, finance reporting system, or um, we are doing uh, our annual audit now. And like, I have never worked with this person before. Oh, wait, but I know them because of this other reason. Um, I don't think I really appreciated the value of the interpersonal connections that we have and the communities that we have built at Slack until this pandemic and seeing how seamless it was um, from an interpersonal perspective to watch our employees continue to remain connected. And I, uh, I think that is a, it's a little bit of like a secret sauce um, that a lot of companies are afraid to embrace. Um, I, I talk to customers a lot in my role, which is one of my favorite parts of my job is just giving them, you know, providing counsel and advice on how to better leverage Slack for their organizations. And so often I hear like, how do you prevent people from having a dog's channel? Or how do you prevent people from having conversations about this or that? And it's like, don't prevent them, like embrace it, like, you know, like give, give people that outlet. Um, and they will be better employees for it. They will be better connected to one another for it. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of energy. It really is um, a powerful part of building the kind of community that's going to rally behind you when things are hard. 
That's sort of like saying, how do you keep someone locked in their cube? <laughs> like, how do oh you keep gosh, people right? out of the kitchen? You wouldn't keep them out of the kitchen. So oh. why would you keep them out of dog chat? Which is like, we have a dog chat and it's one of the highlights of my day. <laughs> it's <laughs> so. the best. I don't even have a dog and I'm in the dog's channel. I mean, it's great. <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah, it is good. It's very good con- quality content. That's what I like to yes, say. But yeah, exactly. absolutely. And, yeah. I think it's the closest replication of that sort of water cooler coffee like yes. station sort of thing. It's definitely organized, it, but it would be kind of nice mm-hmm. to know when you walked into a corporate kitchen who has interests that are the same as yeah. yours. It's sort of exactly. like already identified for you. If you're going into the Mandalorian channel, you know that people are clearly going to talk about that, which we have one yes. of those and it's very helpful. Um, uh, now I need to see if we have a Mandalorian channel because I'm still not fully recovered from the end of this season. So it's so good. I think that there is, I can't even imagine what your Slack instance looks like. That is something that like to think about how Slack uses Slack. I don't know. You guys have probably (laughs) published stuff about it, but I should go take a look. um, Yeah. I mean, we could talk for hours about that for sure, (laughs) but I get, I get asked the question a lot, like how many Slack channels do you even have? And I'm like, I don't know. And I really don't care. Like it doesn't matter to me. Um, That is like the absolute least relevant metric ever. Um, We have a core infrastructure of the official communication channels where you know that you're going to get specific kinds of information on specific topics. Um, You know, we have different uh, targeted audiences very carefully carved out, et cetera. And uh, so I've got like, there's the official communication sort of infrastructure. And then otherwise we have uh, common naming conventions for, you know, whether it's a project channel or it's a, team channel or it's a whatever. Um, And people run with that and they build the channels that they need to be able to do their jobs and to collaborate with their teams and to collaborate cross-functionally. And uh, from there, it's just, you know, use the product as you need to use it. And when you're done with the channel, archive it and that's it. Um, So yeah, I mean, there are, I'm sure that there are many, many, many thousands of channels, but it's, uh, everybody's, everybody's Slack is going to look a little bit different based on their preferences and the kinds of work that they do. But there's enough, um, there's enough of that, uh, again, going back to the role of internal communications, there's enough of that like connective tissue that keeps us all kind of, you know, speaking the same language, moving in the same direction, et cetera, um, to make it work. Awesome. Amanda, I could talk to you all day. So I'm going to, but I know you're a very busy woman. So um, tell our audience where they can find you. Do you have anything coming up? um, Any projects that you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can find me on Twitter at at Amanda Atkins um, and on Instagram at Amanda A. Atkins. Um, Beware though, it's a lot of pictures of my two-year-old son who is um, from a very non-biased point of view, the cutest child ever in the world. (laughs) Um, So, uh, but, but yeah, and on LinkedIn, um, Amanda Atkins, I'm pretty easy to find, even though my name is very common, um, put Amanda Atkins Slack and you'll find me really fast. Um, One other thing I wanted to mention that I'm working on that is really exciting. um, This is something that is going to be launching in a few weeks. Um, I am a founding member of a new organization called Mixing Board, um, which is uh, where companies can seek a uh, senior level executive comms expertise for various levels of support. So whether you want to pick somebody's brain who has been through uh, a major acquisition or an IPO, or you need to do something as big as start building out the internal comms function at your company and you don't know where to start. Um, this is a group of professionals from across industries, um, across uh, geographies, across very different demographics who all have remarkable backgrounds um, that you can tap into in order to get the kind of expertise, mentorship, um, access, visibility, whatever it is that you need in order to achieve your communications goals, um, we will have somebody who can help you and you can tap in um, as little or as much as you want. Um, we will uh, hopefully be able to share a link to uh, the Mixing Board um, internet presence uh, once it is up and running uh, in the show notes for this episode. Um, but really excited to be part of this collective and um, be part of launching a new way that um, organizations can interact with people with different kinds of comms expertise. Because I think, you know, all of us who work in, in roles like this 
um, are always looking for others who have been through some of these crazy situations, you know, whether it's different kinds of crises or different kinds of major company milestones. It's like, how did you do it? Um, can I just pick your brain on this? Or, um, you know, or it's somebody who has very little familiarity, but knows that they need it. They're like, I'm a founder. And I'm at the point where I recognize that my company needs to be thinking strategically about um, agility and culture and change management, but I have no idea where to start. Well, you know, you don't have to go hire somebody as a full-time employee to figure that out for you. You can just tap into us um, on a, you know, as short or a long-term basis as you want in order to make that happen. So I could go on and on, but, um, but I'm excited for the possibilities associated with, uh, with mixing board and we're excited to get started. Yeah. It sounds great. There is some sort of like brotherhood, sisterhood, personhood of folks that have oh. worked in comms. That is like yes. a, a way to talk that, uh, definitely, you know, when you meet, I always joke that I know when I meet another PR person because they have like a little bit of that twinge in their eye that they went, they managed <laughs> some tough stuff. Like that is what I always, <laughs> and yes. I appreciate that, that there's like a sort of, there's a, a common language for sure. And a shared set of experiences. Absolutely. Like you were saying, definitely so true. love that. And to all of you out there, um, if you liked what you heard, if you're interested in listening to more episodes, make sure you like, and subscribe. Um, we are on all of the places you find your favorite podcasts, as well as quickbase.com slash podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel. You want to watch the videos. Um, and we will see you next week on our next episode. Thanks. Bye.